27. Talk at public meeting, concluding convention of Baha'i Temple Unity. 30th of April, 1912. Drill Hall, Masonic Temple, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Joseph H. Hannan. Among the Institutes of the Holy Books is that of the Foundation of Places of Worship. That is to say, an edifice or temple is to be built in order that humanity might find a place of meeting, and this is to be conducive to unity and fellowship among them. The real temple is the very word of God, for to it all humanity must turn, and it is the centre of unity for all mankind. It is the collective centre, the cause of accord and communion of hearts, the sign of the solidarity of the human race, the source of eternal life. Temples are the symbols of the divine uniting force, so that when the people gather there in the house of God, they may recall the fact that the law has been revealed for them and that the law is to unite them. They will realize that just as this temple was founded for the unification of mankind, the law preceding and creating it came forth in the manifest word. Jesus Christ, addressing Peter, said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. This utterance was indicative of the faith of Peter, signifying, This faith of thine, O Peter, is the very cause and message of unity to the nations. It shall be the bond of union between the hearts of men and the foundation of the oneness of the world of humanity. In brief, the original purpose of temples and houses of worship is simply that of unity, places of meeting where various peoples, different races and souls of every capacity may come together in order that love and agreement should be manifest between them. That is why Baha'u'llah has commanded that a place of worship be built for all the religionists of the world, that all religions, races and sects may come together within its universal shelter, that the proclamation of the oneness of mankind shall go forth from its open courts of holiness, the announcement that humanity is the servant of God and that all are submerged in the ocean of his mercy. It is the Mashrugul Askar, the world of existence may be likened to this temple and place of worship. For just as the external world is a place where the people of all races and colours, varying faiths, denominations and conditions come together, just as they are submerged in the same sea of divine favours, so likewise all may meet under the dome of the Mashrul Askar, and adore the one God in the same spirit of truth. For the ages of darkness have passed away, and the century of light has come. Ignorant prejudices are being dispelled, and the light of unity is shining. The differences existing between nations and peoples will soon be annulled, and the fundamentals of the divine religions which are no other than the oneness and solidarity of the human race, are being established. For thousands of years the human race has been at war. It is enough. Now let mankind, for a time at least, consort in amity and peace. Enmity and hatred have ruled. Let the world, for a period, exercise love. For thousands of years the nations have denied each other, considering each other as infidel and inferior. It is sufficient. We must now realize that we are the servants of one God, that we turn to one beneficent Father, live under one divine law, seek 
one reality and have one desire. Thus may we live in the utmost friendship and love, and in return the favours and bounties of God shall surround us. The world of humanity will be reformed. Mankind enjoy a new life. Eternal light will illumine and heavenly moralities become manifest. Then divine policy shall govern the world, for the divine policy is the oneness of humanity. God is just and kind to all. He considers all as his servants. He excludes none, and his judgments are correct and true. No matter how complete human policy and foresight may appear, they are imperfect. If we do not seek the counsel of God, or if we refuse to follow his dictates, it is presumptive evidence that we are knowing and wise, whereas God is ignorant, that we are sagacious and God is not. God forbid. We seek shelter in his mercy for this suggestion. No matter how far the human intelligence may advance, it is still but a drop, while divine omniscience is the ocean. Shall we say that a drop is imbued or endowed with the qualities of which the ocean is devoid? Shall we believe that the policy and plan of this atom of a human soul are superior to the wisdom of the omniscient? There is no greater ignorance than this. Briefly, some are mere children. With the utmost love we must educate them to make them wise. Others are sick and ailing. We must tenderly treat them until they recover. Some have unworthy morals. We must train them toward the standard of true morality. Other than this, we are all the servants of one God, and under the providence and protection of one Father. These are the institutions of God and the foundations of his temple, the Mashrugal Askar. The outer edifice is a symbol of the inner. May the people be admonished thereby. I pray in your behalf that your hearts may be enlightened with the light of the love of God, that your minds may develop daily, that your spirits may become aglow with the fire and illumination of his glad tidings, until these divine foundations may become established throughout the human world. The first of these institutions and foundations is the oneness of humanity and love among mankind. The second is the most great peace. Praise be to God. This American democracy manifests capacity showing forth readiness to become the standard bearer of the most great peace. May its hosts be the hosts of the oneness of humanity. May they serve the threshold of God and spread the message of the good pleasure of God. O thou kind Lord, this gathering is turning to thee. These hearts are radiant with thy love. These minds and spirits are exhilarated by the message of thy glad tidings. O God, let this American democracy become glorious in spiritual degrees, even as it has aspired to material degrees, and render this just government victorious. Confirm this revered nation to upraise the standard of the oneness of humanity, to promulgate the most great peace, to become thereby most glorious and praiseworthy among all the nations of the world. O oh God, this American nation is worthy of thy favours and is deserving of thy mercy. Make it precious and near to thee through thy bounty and bestowal. 28. Talk at Hull House 30th April, 
1912. Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Joseph H. Hannon. When we view the world of creation, we find that all living things may be classified under two aspects of existence. First, they possess bodies composed of material substance common to all, whether vegetable, animal, or human. This is their point of agreement, or, as it is philosophically termed, their point of contact. Second, they vary and differ from each other in degree and function, that is to say, in their respective kingdoms. This is their point of distinction and differentiation. For instance, the vegetable and animal are alike in the fact that their bodies are composed of the same material elements, but widely different in their kingdoms and powers. Man is like the animal in physical structure, but otherwise immeasurably separated and superior. In the human kingdom itself, there are points of contact, properties common to all mankind. Likewise, there are points of distinction which separate race from race, individual from individual. If the points of contact, which are the common properties of humanity, overcome the peculiar points of distinction, unity is assured. On the other hand, if the points of differentiation overcome the points of agreement, disunion and weakness result. One of the important questions which affect the unity and the solidarity of mankind is the fellowship and equality of the white and coloured races. Between these two races, certain points of agreement and points of distinction exist, which warrant just and mutual consideration. The points of contact are many, for in the material or physical plane of being, both are constituted alike and exist under the same law of growth and bodily development. Furthermore, both live and move in the plane of the senses and are endowed with human intelligence. There are many other mutual qualifications. In this country, the United States of America, patriotism is common to both races. All have equal rights to citizenship, speak one language, receive the blessings of the same civilization, and follow the precepts of the same religion. In fact, numerous points of partnership and agreement exist between the two races, whereas the one point of distinction is that of color. Shall this, the least of all distinctions, be allowed to separate you as races and individuals? In physical bodies, in the law of growth, in sense endowment, intelligence, patriotism, language, citizenship, civilization, and religion, you are one and the same. A single point of distinction exists, that of racial color. God is not pleased with, neither should any reasonable or intelligent man be willing to recognize, inequality in the races because of this distinction. But there is need of a superior power to overcome human prejudices, a power which nothing in the world of mankind can withstand, and which will overshadow the effect of all other forces at work in human conditions. That irresistible power is the love of God. It is my hope and prayer that it may destroy the prejudice of this one point of distinction between you and unite you all permanently under its hallowed protection. Baha'u'llah has proclaimed the oneness of the world of humanity. He has caused various nations and divergent creeds to unite. He has declared the difference of race and color is like the variegated beauty of flowers in a garden. If you enter a garden, 
You will see yellow, white, blue, red flowers in perfusion and beauty, each radiant within itself, and although different from the others, lending its own charm to them. Racial difference in the human kingdom is similar. If all the flowers in the garden were of the same colour, the effect would be monotonous and wearying to the eye. Therefore, Baha'u'llah hath said that the various races of humankind lend a composite harmony and beauty of colour to the whole. Let all associate, therefore, in this great human garden, even as flowers grow and blend together side by side without discord or disagreement between them. 29. Talk at Fourth Annual Conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. 30th April 1912. Handel Hall, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Joseph H. Hannon. According to the words of the Old Testament, God has said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This indicates that man is of the image and likeness of God, that is to say, the perfections of God, the divine virtues, are reflected or revealed in the human reality. Just as the light and effulgence of the sun, when cast upon a polished mirror, are reflected fully, gloriously, so likewise the qualities and attributes of divinity are radiated from the depths of a pure human heart. This is an evidence that man is the most noble of God's creatures. Each kingdom of creation is endowed with its necessary complement of attributes and powers. The mineral possesses inherent virtues of its own kingdom in the scale of existence. The vegetable possesses the qualities of the mineral plus an augmentative virtue or power of growth. The animal is endowed with the virtues of both the mineral and vegetable plane plus the power of intellect. The human kingdom is replete with the perfections of all the kingdoms below it with the addition of powers peculiar to man alone. Man is, therefore, superior to all the creatures below him, the loftiest and most glorious being of creation. Man is the microcosm, and the infinite universe the macrocosm. The mysteries of the greater world, or macrocosm, are expressed or revealed in the lesser world, the microcosm. The tree, so to speak, is the greater world, and the seed in its relation to the tree is the lesser world, but the whole of the great tree is potentially latent and hidden in the little seed. When this seed is planted and cultivated, the tree is revealed. Likewise, the greater world, the macrocosm, is latent and miniatured in the lesser world or microcosm of man. This constitutes the universality or perfection of virtues potential in mankind. Therefore it is said that man has been created in the image and likeness of God. Let us now discover more specifically how he is the image and likeness of God and what is the standard or criterion by which he can be measured and estimated. This standard can be no other than the divine virtues which are revealed in him. Therefore, every man imbued with divine qualities, who reflects heavenly moralities and perfections, who is the expression of ideal and praiseworthy attributes, is verily in the image and likeness of God. If a man possesses wealth, can we call him an image and likeness of God? Or is human honour and notoriety the criterion of divine nearness? Can we apply the test of racial colour 
and say that man of a certain hue, white, black, brown, yellow, red, is the true image of his creator. We must conclude that colour is not the standard and estimate of judgment, and that it is of no importance, for colour is accidental in nature. The spirit and intelligence of man is essential, and that is the manifestation of divine virtues, the merciful bestowals of God, the eternal life and baptism through the Holy Spirit. Therefore be it known that colour or race is of no importance. He who is the image and likeness of God, who is the manifestation of the bestowals of God, is acceptable at the threshold of God, whether his colour be white, black or brown. It matters not. Man is not man simply because of bodily attributes. The standard of divine measure and judgment is his intelligence and spirit. Therefore, let this be the only criterion and estimate, for this is the image and likeness of God. A man's heart may be pure and white, though his outer skin be black, or his heart be dark and sinful, though his racial colour is white. The character and purity of the heart is of all importance. The heart, illumined by the light of God, is nearest and dearest to God. And inasmuch as God has endowed man with such favour that he is called the image of God, this is truly a supreme perfection of attainment, a divine station which is not to be sacrificed by the mere accident of colour. 30. Talk at Dedication of the Mashrugal Askar Grounds 1st of May, 1912 Wilmet, Illinois Notes by Joseph H. Hannon The power which has gathered you here today, notwithstanding the cold and windy weather, is indeed mighty and wonderful. It is the power of God, the divine favour of Baha'u'llah which has drawn you together. We praise God that through His constraining love, Human souls are assembled and associated in this way. Thousands of mashrugal askars, dawning points of praise and mention of God for all religionists, will be built in the East and in the West. But this, being the first one erected in the Occident, has great importance. In the future, there will be many here and elsewhere in Asia, Europe, even in Africa, New Zealand and Australia. But this edifice in Chicago is of special significance. It has the same importance as the Mashrul Askar in Eshgabad, Caucasus, Russia, the first one built there. In Persia there are many some are houses which have been utilised for the purpose, others are homes entirely devoted to the divine cause, and in some places temporary structures have been erected. In all the cities of Persia there are Mashrugal Askars, but the great dawning point was founded in Eshgabad. It possesses superlative importance because it was the first Mashrugal Askar built. All the Baha'i friends agreed and contributed their utmost assistance and effort. The Afnan devoted his wealth, gave all he had to it. From such a mighty and combined effort, a beautiful edifice arose. Notwithstanding their contributions to that building, they have assisted the fund here in Chicago as well. The Mashrugal Askar in Eshgabad is almost completed. It is centrally located, nine avenues leading into it, nine gardens, nine fountains. All the arrangement and construction is according to the principle and proportion of the number nine. It is 
like a beautiful bouquet. Imagine a very lofty, imposing edifice, surrounded completely by gardens of variegated flowers, with nine avenues leading through them, nine fountains and pools of water. Such is its matchless, beautiful design. Now they are building a hospital, a school for orphans, a home for cripples, a hospice and a large dispensary. God willing, when it is fully completed, it will be a paradise. I hope the Mashrul Askar in Chicago will be like this. Endeavour to have the grounds circular in shape. If possible, adjust and exchange the plots in order to make the dimensions and boundaries circular. The Mashrul Askar cannot be triangular in shape. It must be in the form of a circle. 31. Talk at Hotel Plaza, 2nd May, 1912, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Joseph H. Hannon. In this cause, consultation is of vital importance, but spiritual conference, and not the mere voicing of personal views, is intended. In France, I was present at a session of the Senate, but the experience was not impressive. Parliamentary procedure should have for its object the attainment of the light of truth upon questions presented, and not furnish a battleground for opposition and self-opinion. Antagonism and contradiction are unfortunate and always destructive to truth. In the parliamentary meeting mentioned, altercation and useless quibbling were frequent. The result? Mostly confusion and turmoil. Even in one instance, a physical encounter took place between two members. It was not consultation, but comedy. The purpose is to emphasize the statement that consultation must have for its object the investigation of truth. He who expresses an opinion should not voice it as correct and right, but set it forth as a contribution to the consensus of opinion. For the light of reality becomes apparent when two opinions coincide. A spark is produced when flint and steel come together. Man should weigh his opinions with the utmost serenity, calmness, and composure. Before expressing his own views, he should carefully consider the views already advanced by others. If he finds that a previously expressed opinion is more true and worthy, he should accept it immediately and not willfully hold to an opinion of his own. By this excellent method, he endeavours to arrive at unity and truth. Opposition and division are deplorable. It is better, then, to have the opinion of a wise, sagacious man. Otherwise, contradiction and altercation, in which varied and divergent views are presented, will make it necessary for a judicial body to render decision upon the question. Even a majority opinion or consensus may be incorrect. A thousand people may hold to one view and be mistaken, whereas one sagacious person may be right. Therefore, true consultation is spiritual conference in the attitude and atmosphere of love. Members must love each other in the spirit of fellowship, in order that good results may be forthcoming. Love and fellowship are the foundation. The most memorable instance of spiritual consultation was the meeting of the disciples of Jesus Christ upon the mount after his ascension. They said, Jesus Christ has been crucified, and we have no longer association and intercourse with him in his physical body. Therefore, 
We must be loyal and faithful to him. We must be grateful and appreciate him, for he has raised us from the dead. He made us wise. He has given us eternal life. What shall we do to be faithful to him? And so they held counsel. One of them said, We must detach ourselves from the chains and fetters of the world, otherwise we cannot be faithful. The others replied, That is so. Another said, Either we must be married and faithful to our wives and children, or serve our Lord free from these ties. We cannot be occupied with the care and provision for families, and at the same time herald the kingdom in the wilderness. Therefore, let those who are unmarried remain so, and those who have married provide means of sustenance and comfort for their families, and then go forth to spread the message of glad tidings. There were no dissenting voices, all agreed, saying, That is right. A third disciple said, To perform worthy deeds in the kingdom, we must be further self-sacrificing. From now on we should forego ease and bodily comfort, accept every difficulty, forget self, and teach the cause of God. This found acceptance and approval by all the others. Finally, a fourth disciple said, There is still another aspect to our faith and unity. For Jesus' sake, we shall be beaten, imprisoned, and exiled. They may kill us. Let us receive this lesson now. Let us realize and resolve that though we are beaten, banished, cursed, spat upon, and led forth to be killed, we shall accept all this joyfully, loving those who hate and wound us. All the disciples replied, Surely we will. It is agreed. This is right. Then they descended from the summit of the mountain, and each went forth in a different direction upon his divine mission. This was true consultation. This was spiritual consultation, and not the mere voicing of personal views in parliamentary opposition and debate. 32. Talk to Federation of Women's Clubs 2nd May 1912 Hotel La Salle, Chicago, Illinois Notes by Joseph H. Hannan One of the functions of the sun is to quicken and reveal the hidden realities of the kingdoms of existence. Through the light and heat of the great central luminary, all that is potential in the earth is awakened and comes forth into the realm of the visible. The fruit hidden in the tree appears upon its branches in response to the power of the sun. Man and all other organisms live, move and have their being under its developing rays. Nature is resplendent with countless evolutionary forms through its pervading impulse, so that we can say a function of the sun is the revelation of the mysteries and creative purposes hidden within the phenomenal world. The outer sun is a sign or symbol of the inner and ideal sun of truth, the word of God, Inasmuch as this is the century of light, it is evident that the Son of Reality, the Word, has revealed itself to all mankind. One of the potentialities hidden in the realm of humanity was the capability or capacity of womanhood. Through the effulgent rays of divine illumination, the capacity of woman has become so awakened and manifest in this age that equality of man and woman is an established fact. In past ages, woman was wronged and oppressed. This was especially the case in Asia and Africa. In certain parts of Asia, women were not considered as members of humankind. They were looked upon as inferior, 
unworthy creatures, subordinate and subject to man. A certain people, known as the Noseiris, held to the belief for a long period that woman was the incarnation of the evil spirit, or Satan, and that man alone was the manifestation of God the Merciful. At last, this century of light dawned. The realities shone forth and the mysteries, long hidden from human vision, were revealed. Among these revealed realities was the great principle of the equality of man and woman, which is now finding recognition throughout the whole world, America, Europe, and the Orient. History records the appearance in the world of women who have been signs of guidance, power, and accomplishment. Some were notable poets, some philosophers and scientists, others courageous upon the field of battle. Oratul Ain, a Baha'i, was a poetess. She discomforted the learned men of Persia by her brilliancy and fervor. When she entered a meeting, even the learned were silent. She was so well-versed in philosophy and science that those in her presence always considered and consulted her first. Her courage was unparalleled. She faced her enemies fearlessly until she was killed. She withstood a despotic king, the Shah of Persia, who had the power to decree the death of any of his subjects. There was not a day during which he did not command the execution of some. This woman, singly and alone, withstood such a despot until her last breath, then gave her life for her faith. Consider the mysteries revealed during the last half-century, all due to the effulgence of the Son of Reality, which has been so gloriously manifested in this age and cycle. In this day, man must investigate reality impartially and without prejudice in order to reach the true knowledge and conclusions. What, then, constitutes the inequality between man and woman? Both are human. In powers and function, each is the complement of the other. At most it is this, that woman has been denied the opportunities which man has so long enjoyed, especially the privilege of education. But even this is not always a shortcoming. Shall we consider it an imperfection and weakness in her nature that she is not proficient in the school of military tactics, that she cannot go forth to the field of battle and kill, that she is not able to handle a deadly weapon? Nay, rather, is it not a compliment when we say that in hardness of heart and cruelty she is inferior to man? The woman who is asked to arm herself and kill her fellow creatures will say, I cannot. Is this to be considered a fault and lack of qualification as man's equal? Yet be it known that if woman had been taught and trained in the military science of slaughter, she would have been the equivalent of man, even in this accomplishment. But God forbid, may woman never attain this proficiency, may she never wield weapons of war, for the destruction of humanity is not a glorious achievement. The upbuilding of a home, the bringing of joy and comfort into human hearts are truly glories of mankind. Let not a man glory in this, that he can kill his fellow creatures. Nay, rather, let him glory in this, that he can love them. When we consider the kingdoms of existence below man, we find no distinction or estimate of superiority and inferiority between male and female. Among the myriad organisms of the vegetable and animal kingdoms, sex exists, but there is no differentiation whatever 
as to relative importance and value in the equation of life. If we investigate impartially, we may even find species in which the female is superior or preferable to the male. For instance, there are trees such as the fig, the male of which is fruitless, while the female is fruitful. The male of the date palm is valueless, while the female bears abundantly. Inasmuch as we find no ground for distinction or superiority, according to the creative wisdom in the lower kingdoms, is it logical or becoming of man to make such distinction in regard to himself? The male of the animal kingdom does not glory in its being male and superior to the female. In fact, equality exists and is recognized. Why should man, a higher and more intelligent creature, deny and deprive himself of this equality the animals enjoy? His surest index and guide as to the creative intention concerning himself are the conditions and analogies of the kingdoms below him, where equality of the sexes is fundamental. The truth is that all mankind are the creatures and servants of one God, and in his estimate, all are human. Man is a generic term applying to all humanity. The biblical statement, let us make man in our image after our likeness, does not mean that woman was not created. The image and likeness of God apply to her as well. In Persian and Arabic, there are two distinct words translated into English as man, one meaning man and woman collectively, the other distinguishing man as male from woman the female. The first word and its pronoun are generic, collective. The other is restricted to the male. This is the same in Hebrew. To accept and observe a distinction which God has not intended in creation is ignorance and superstition. The fact which is to be considered, however, is that woman, having formerly been deprived, must now be allowed equal opportunities with man for education and training. There must be no difference in their education. Until the reality of equality between man and woman is fully established and attained, the highest social development of mankind is not possible. Even granted that woman is inferior to man in some degree of capacity or accomplishment, this or any other distinction would continue to be productive of discord and trouble. The only remedy is education, opportunity, for equality means equal qualification. In brief, the assumption of superiority by man will continue to be depressing to the ambition of woman, as if her attainment to equality were creationally impossible. Woman's aspiration towards advancement will be checked by it, and she will gradually become hopeless. On the contrary, we must declare that her capacity is equal, even greater than man's. This will inspire her with hope and ambition, and her susceptibilities for advancement will continually increase. She must not be told and taught that she is weaker and inferior in capacity and qualification. If a pupil is told that his intelligence is less than his fellow pupils, it is a very great drawback and handicap to his progress. He must be encouraged to advance by the statement, You are most capable, and if you endeavour, you will attain the highest degree. It is my hope that the banner of equality may be raised throughout the five continents, whereas yet it is not fully recognised and established. In this enlightened world of the West, 
woman has advanced an immeasurable degree beyond the women of the Orient. And let it be known once more that until woman and man recognize and realize equality, social and political progress here or anywhere will not be possible. For the world of humanity consists of two parts or members. One is woman, the other is man. Until these two members are equal in strength, the oneness of humanity cannot be established, and the happiness and felicity of mankind will not be a reality. God willing, this is to be so. 33. Talk at Baha'i Women's Reception 2nd May 1912 Hotel La Salle, Chicago, Illinois Notes by Joseph H. Hannon When we look upon the kingdoms of creation below man, we find three forms or planes of existence which await education and development. For instance, the function of a gardener is to till the soil of the mineral kingdom and plant a tree which under his training and cultivation will attain perfection of growth. If it be wild and fruitless, it may be made fruitful and prolific by grafting. If small and unsightly, it will become lofty, beautiful, and verdant under the gardener's training, whereas a tree bereft of his cultivation retrogresses daily. Its fruit grows acrid and bitter as the trees of the jungle, or it may become entirely barren and bereft of its fruitage. Likewise, we observe that animals which have undergone training in their sphere of limitation will progress and advance unmistakably, become more beautiful in appearance and increase in intelligence. For instance, how intelligent and knowing the Arabian horse has become through training even how polite this horse has become through education. As to the human world, it is more in need of guidance and education than the lower creatures. Reflect upon the vast difference between the inhabitants of Africa and those of America. Here, the people have been civilized and uplifted. There, they are in the utmost and abject state of savagery. What is the cause of their savagery and the reason of your civilization? It is evident that this difference is due to education and the lack of education. Consider, then, the effectiveness of education in the human kingdom. It makes the ignorant wise, the tyrant merciful, the blind seeing, the deaf attentive, even the imbecile intelligent. How vast this difference! How wide the chasm which separates the educated man from the man who lacks teaching and training. This is the effect when the teacher is merely an ordinary teacher. But praise be to God, your teacher and instructor is Baha'u'llah. He is the educator of the Orient and Occident. He is the teacher of the very world of divinity and spirituality. The Son of Truth, the Word of God. The lights of his education are radiating even as the sun. See what it has accomplished, how it is developing all humanity, so that I, a Persian, have come to this meeting of revered souls upon the American continent, and am standing here expounding to you in the greatest love. This is through the training of Baha'u'llah, which can unite and has united these hearts. In this way, it has enlightened the world. Even so, it has breathed the Spirit of God into men. Even so, it has resuscitated the hearts of men. Therefore, praise be to God, that you have been brought under the education of this one who is the very son of reality 
and who is shining resplendently upon all humankind, endowing all with a life that is everlasting. Praise be to God a thousand times. 34. Talk at Hotel Plaza 2nd May 1912 Chicago, Illinois Notes by Marzia Moss This morning the city is enveloped in fog and mist. How beautiful is a city brilliant with sunshine! Just as these mists and vapours conceal the phenomenal sun, so human imaginations obscure the sun of truth. Consider the radiant glory of the great solar centre of our planetary system. How wonderful the sight! How its splendour illumines vision until clouds and mists veil it from the eye. In the same way, the sun of truth becomes veiled and hidden by the superstitions and imaginations of human minds. When the sun rises, no matter from what dawning point on the horizon it appears, northeast, east, southeast, the haze and mists disperse, and we have clear vision of its glory mounting to the zenith. Similarly, the nations have been directed to the dawning points of the Sun of Reality, each to a particular rising place from which the light of religion has become manifest. But after a time, the dawning point has become the object of worship instead of the Sun itself, which is ever one sun and stationary in the heavens of the divine will. Differences have arisen because of this, causing clouds and darkness to overshadow again the glorious luminary of reality. When the mists and darkness of superstition and prejudice are dispersed, all will see the sun aright and alike. Then will all nations become as one in its radiance. Inasmuch as these clouds and human vapours of superstition hide the light of the spiritual sun, we must put forth our utmost endeavour to dispel them. May we unite in this and be enlightened to accomplish it, for the sun is one and its radiance and bounty universal. All the inhabitants of earth are recipients of the bounty of the one phenomenal sun, and none are preferred above others. So likewise, all receive the heavenly bestowals of the word of God. None are specialized as favorites. All are under its protection and universal effulgence. Human strife and religious disagreement complex and disfigure the simple purity and beauty of the divine cause until clouds obscure the light of reality and disunion results. Therefore, make use of intelligence and reason so that you may dispel these dense clouds from the horizon of human hearts and all hold to the one reality of all the prophets. It is most certain that if human souls exercise their respective reason and intelligence upon the divine questions, the power of God will dispel every difficulty and the eternal realities will appear as one light, one truth, one love, one God and a peace that is universal. 35. Talk at Hotel Plaza, 2nd May 1912, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Henrietta C. Wagner When we carefully investigate the kingdoms of existence and observe the phenomena of the universe about us, we discover the absolute order and perfection of creation. 
the dull minerals in their affinities, plants and vegetables with power of growth, animals in their instinct, man with conscious intellect, and the heavenly orbs moving obediently through limitless space, are all found subject to universal law, most complete, most perfect. That is why a wise philosopher has said, there is no greater or more perfect system of creation than that which already exists. The materialists and atheists declare that this order and symmetry is due to nature and its forces, that composition and decomposition which constitute life and existence are exigencies of nature, that man himself is an exigency of nature, that nature rules and governs creation, and that all existing things are captives of nature. Let us consider these statements. Inasmuch as we find all phenomena subject to an exact order and under control of universal law, the question is whether this is due to nature or to divine and omnipotent rule. The materialists believe that it is an exigency of nature for the rain to fall, and that unless rain fell, the earth would not become verdant. They reason that if clouds cause a downpour, if the sun sends forth heat and light, and the earth is endowed with capacity, vegetation must inevitably follow. Therefore, plant life is a property of these natural forces and is a sign of nature. Just as combustion is the natural property of fire, therefore fire burns, and we cannot conceive of fire without its burning. In reply to these statements, we say that from the premises advanced by materialists, the conclusions are drawn that nature is the ruler and governor of existence, and that all virtues and perfections are natural exigencies and outcomes. Furthermore, it follows that man is but a part or member of that whereof nature is the whole. Man possesses certain virtues of which nature is deprived. He exercises volition. Nature is without will. For instance, an exigency of the sun is the giving of light. It is controlled. It cannot do otherwise than radiate light, but it is not volitional. An exigency of the phenomenon of electricity is that it is revealed in sparks and flashes under certain conditions, but it cannot voluntarily furnish illumination. An exigency of property of water is humidity. It cannot separate itself from this property by its own will. Likewise, all the properties of nature are inherent and obedient, not volitional. Therefore, it is philosophically predicted that nature is without volition and innate perception. In this statement and principle, we agree with the materialists. But the question which presents food for reflection is this. How is it that man, who is a part of the universal plan, is possessed of certain qualities whereof nature is devoid? Is it conceivable that a drop should be imbued with qualities of which the ocean is completely deprived? The drop is part, the ocean is the whole. Could there be a phenomenon of combustion or illumination which the great luminary, the sun itself, did not manifest? Is it possible for a stone to possess inherent properties of which the aggregate mineral kingdom is lacking? For example, could the fingernail, which is a part of human anatomy, be endowed with cellular properties of which the brain is deprived? Man is intelligent, instinctively and consciously intelligent. Nature is not. Man is fortified with memory. Nature does not possess it. Man is the discoverer of the mysteries of nature. Nature is not conscious of those mysteries herself. 
It is evident, therefore, that man is dual in aspect. As an animal, he is subject to nature, but in his spiritual or conscious being, he transcends the world of material existence. His spiritual powers, being nobler and higher, possess virtues of which nature intrinsically has no evidence. Therefore, they triumph over natural conditions. These ideal virtues or powers in man surpass or surround nature, comprehend natural laws and phenomena, penetrate the mysteries of the unknown and invisible, and bring them forth into the realm of the known and visible. All the existing arts and sciences were once hidden secrets of nature. By his command and control of nature, man took them out of the plane of the invisible and revealed them in the plane of visibility, whereas according to the exigencies of nature, these secrets should have remained latent and concealed. According to the exigencies of nature, electricity should be a hidden, mysterious power. But the penetrating intellect of man has discovered it, taken it out of the realm of mystery, and made it an obedient human servant. In his physical body and its functions, man is a captive of nature. For instance, he cannot continue his existence without sleep, an exigency of nature. He must partake of food and drink, which nature demands and requires. But in his spiritual being and intelligence, man dominates and controls nature, the ruler of his physical being. Notwithstanding this, contrary opinions and materialistic views are set forth, which would relegate man completely to physical subservience to nature's laws. This is equivalent to saying that the comparative degree exceeds the superlative, that the imperfect includes the perfect, that the pupil surpasses the teacher, all of which is illogical and impossible. When it is clearly manifest and evident that the intelligence of man, his constructive faculty, his power of penetration and discovery transcend nature, how can we say he is nature's thrall and captive? This would indicate that man is deprived of the bounties of God, that he is retrograding toward the station of the animal, that his keen superintelligence is without function, and that he estimates himself as an animal without distinction between his own and the animal's kingdom. I was once conversing with a famous philosopher of the materialistic school in Alexandria. He was strongly opinionated upon the point that man and the other kingdoms of existence are under the control of nature, and that after all man is only a social animal, often very much of an animal. When he was discomforted in argument, he said impetuously, I see no difference between myself and the donkey, and I am not willing to admit distinctions which I cannot perceive. Abdu'l-Bahá replied, No, I consider you quite different and distinct. I call you a man, and the donkey, but an animal. I perceive you are highly intelligent, whereas the donkey is not. I know that you are well versed in philosophy, and I also know that the donkey is entirely deficient in it. Therefore, I am not willing to accept your statement. Consider the lady beside me who is writing in this little book. It seems a very trifling, ordinary matter, but upon intelligent reflection you will conclude that what has been written presupposes and proves the existence of a writer. These words have not written themselves, and these letters have not come together of their own volition. It is evident there must be a writer. And now consider this infinite universe. Is it possible that it could have been created without a creator? Or that the creator and cause of this 
infinite congeries of worlds should be without intelligence? Is the idea tenable that the Creator has no comprehension of what is manifested in creation? Man, the creature, has volition and certain virtues. Is it possible that his Creator is deprived of these? A child could not accept this belief and statement. It is perfectly evident that man did not create himself, and that he cannot do so. How could man of his own weakness create such a mighty being? Therefore, the creator of man must be more perfect and powerful than man. If the creative cause of man be simply on the same level with man, then man himself should be able to create, whereas we know very well that we cannot create even our own likeness. Therefore, the creator of man must be endowed with superlative intelligence and power in all points that creation involves and implies. We are weak, he is mighty, because were he not mighty, he could not have created us. We are ignorant, he is wise. We are poor, he is rich. Otherwise, he would have been incapable of our creation. Among the proofs of the existence of a divine power is this, that things are often known by their opposites. Were it not for darkness, light could not be sensed. Were it not for death, life could not be known. If ignorance did not exist, knowledge would not be a reality. It is necessary that each should exist in order that the other should have reality. Night and day must be in order that each may be distinguished. Night itself is an indication and evidence of day which follows, and day itself indicates the coming night. Unless night were a reality, there could not be day. Were it not for death, there could be no life. Things are known by their opposites. Therefore our weakness is an evidence that there is might. Our ignorance proves the reality of knowledge. Our need is an indication of supply and wealth. Were it not for wealth, this need would not exist. Were it not for knowledge, ignorance would be unknown. Were it not for power, there would be no impotence. In other words, demand and supply is the law, and undoubtedly all virtues have a center and source. That source is God, from whom all these bounties emanate. 36. Talk at Hotel Plaza, 3rd May 1912, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Marzia Moss. I was in the Orient, and from the Orient to this part of the world is a long distance. Travel is difficult, especially difficult for me on account of my infirmities of body, increased by forty years in prison. My physical powers are weak. It is the power of will that sustains me. Realize from this how great has been my exertion and how strong my purpose in accomplishing this journey through the will of God. May it be the cause of great illumination in the Occident. In this Western world, with its stimulating climate, its capacities for knowledge and lofty ideals, the message of peace should be easily spread. The people are not so influenced by imitations and prejudices, and through their comprehension of the real and unreal, they should attain the truth. They should become leaders in the effort to establish the oneness of humankind. What is higher than this responsibility? In the kingdom of God no service is greater, and in the estimation of the prophets, including Jesus Christ, 
There is no deed so estimable. Yet even now warfare prevails. Envy and hatred have arisen between nations. But because I find the American nation so capable of achievement, and this government the fairest of Western governments, its institutions superior to others, my wish and hope is that the banner of international reconciliation may first be raised on this continent, and the standard of the most great peace be unfurled here. May the American people and their government unite in their efforts in order that this light may dawn from this point and spread to all regions, for this is one of the greatest bestowals of God. In order that America may avail herself of this opportunity, I beg that you strive and pray with heart and soul, devoting all your energies to this end that the banner of international peace may be upraised here, and that this democracy may be the cause of the cessation of warfare in all other countries. Observe what is taking place in Tripoli, men cutting each other into pieces, bombardment from the sea, attacks from the land, and the hail of dynamite from the very heaven itself. The contending armies are thirsting for each other's blood. How they can do this is inconceivable. They have fathers, mothers, children. They are human. What of their wives and families? Think of their anguish and suffering. How unjust, how terrible. Human beings should prevent and forbid this. These kings, rulers, and chieftains should strive for the good of their subjects instead of their destruction. These shepherds should bring their sheep within the fold, comfort them, and give them pasture instead of death and slaughter. I supplicate the divine kingdom and ask that you may be instrumental in establishing the great peace in this country, and that this government and nation may spread it to all the world. 37. Talk at Hotel Plaza 3rd May 1912 Chicago, Illinois Notes by Marzia Moss According to the statement of philosophers, the difference in degree of humankind from lowest to highest is due to education. The proofs they advance are these. The civilization of Europe and America is an evidence and outcome of education, whereas the semi-civilized and barbarous peoples of Africa bear witness in their condition that they have been deprived of its advantages. Education makes the ignorant wise, the tyrant just, promotes happiness, strengthens the mind, develops the will, and makes fruitless trees of humanity fruitful. Therefore, in the human world, some have attained lofty degrees, while others grope in the abyss of despair. Nevertheless, the highest attainment is possible for every member of the human race, even to the station of the prophets. This is the statement and reasoning of the philosophers. The prophets of God are the first educators. They bestow universal education upon man and cause him to rise from the lowest levels of savagery to the highest pinnacles of spiritual development. The philosophers, too, are educators along lines of intellectual training. At most, they have only been able to educate themselves and a limited number about them, to improve their own morals and, so to speak, civilize themselves, but they have been incapable of universal education. They have failed to cause an advancement for any given nation from savagery to civilization. It is evident that although education improves the morals of mankind, confers the advantages of civilization, and elevates man from lowest degrees to the station of sublimity, there is nevertheless 
a difference in the intrinsic or natal capacity of individuals. Ten children of the same age, with equal station of birth, taught in the same school, partaking of the same food, in all respects subject to the same environment, their interests equal and in common, will evidence separate and distinct degrees of capability and advancement. Some will be exceedingly intelligent and progressive, some of mediocre ability, others limited and incapable. One may become a learned professor, while another, under the same course of education, proves dull and stupid. From all standpoints, the opportunities have been equal, but the results and outcomes vary from the highest to the lowest degree of advancement. It is evident, therefore, that mankind differs in natal capacity and intrinsic intellectual endowment. Nevertheless, although capacities are not the same, every member of the human race is capable of education. Jesus Christ was an educator of humanity. His teachings were altruistic, his bestowal universal. He taught mankind by the power of the Holy Spirit and not through human agency, for the human power is limited, whereas the divine power is illimitable and infinite. The influence and accomplishment of Christ will attest this. Galen, the Greek physician and philosopher, who lived in the second century AD, wrote a treatise upon the civilization of nations. He was not a Christian, but he bore testimony that religious beliefs exercise an extraordinary effect upon the problems of civilization. In substance, he said, There are certain people among us, followers of Jesus the Nazarene, who was killed in Jerusalem. These people are truly imbued with moral principles, which are the envy of philosophers. They believe in God and fear him. They have hopes in his favours. Therefore, they shun all unworthy deeds and actions, and incline to praiseworthy ethics and morals. Day and night they strive that their deeds may be commendable, and that they may contribute to the welfare of humanity. Therefore, each one of them is virtually a philosopher, for these people have attained unto that which is the essence and purport of philosophy. These people have praiseworthy morals, even though they may be illiterate. The purpose of this is to show that the holy manifestations of God, the divine prophets, are the first teachers of the human race. They are universal educators, and the fundamental principles they have laid down are the causes and factors of the advancement of nations. Forms and imitations which creep in afterward are not conducive to that progress. On the contrary, these are destroyers of human foundations established by the heavenly educators. These are clouds which obscure the sun of reality. If you reflect upon the essential teachings of Jesus, you will realize that they are the light of the world. Nobody can question their truth. They are the very source of life and the cause of happiness to the human race. The forms and superstitions which appeared and obscured the light did not affect the reality of Christ. For example, Jesus Christ said, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The meaning is that warfare is forbidden and abrogated. But consider the Christian wars which took place afterward. Christian hostility and inquisition spared not even the learned. He who proclaimed the revolution of the earth was imprisoned. He who announced the new astronomical system was persecuted as a heretic. Scholars and scientists became objects of fanatical hatred, and many were killed and tortured. How do these actions conform with the teachings of Jesus Christ, and what relation do they bear to his own example? For Christ declared 
Love your enemies and pray for them which persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. How can hatred, hostility, and persecution be reconciled with Christ and his teachings? Therefore there is need of turning back to the original foundation. The fundamental principles of the prophets are correct and true. The imitations and superstitions which have crept in are at wide variance with the original precepts and commands. Baha'u'llah has revoiced and re-established the quintessence of the teachings of all the prophets, setting aside the accessories and purifying religion from human interpretation. He has written a book entitled The Hidden Words. The preface announces that it contains the essences of the words of the prophets of the past, clothed in the garment of brevity for the teaching and spiritual guidance of the people of the world. Read it that you may understand the true foundations of religion and reflect upon the inspiration of the messengers of God. It is light upon light. We must not look for truth in the deeds and actions of nations. We must investigate truth at its divine source and summon all mankind to unity in reality itself. 38. Talk to Theosophical Society 4th May 1912 Northwestern University Hall, Evanston, Illinois Notes by Marzia Moss I am very happy in being present at this meeting. Praised be to God. I see before me the faces of those who are endowed with capacity to know and who desire to investigate truth. This is conducive to the greatest joy. According to divine philosophy, there are two important and universal conditions in the world of material phenomena, one which concerns life, the other concerning death, one relative to existence, the other non-existence, one manifest in composition, the other in decomposition. Some define existence as the expression of reality or being, and non-existence as non-being, imagining that death is annihilation. This is a mistaken idea, for total annihilation is an impossibility. At most, composition is ever subject to decomposition or disintegration. That is to say, existence implies the grouping of material elements in a form or body, and non-existence is simply the decomposing of these groupings. This is the law of creation in its endless forms and infinite variety of expression. Certain elements have formed the composite creature of man. This composite association of the elements in the form of a human body is therefore subject to disintegration, which we call death. But after disintegration, the elements themselves persist unchanged. Therefore, total annihilation is an impossibility and existence can never become non-existence. This would be the equivalent to saying that light can become darkness, which is manifestly untrue and impossible. As existence can never become non-existence, there is no death for man. Nay, rather, man is everlasting and ever-living. The rational proof of this is that the atoms of the material elements are transferable from one form of existence to another, from one degree and kingdom to another, lower or higher. For example, 
an atom of the soil or dust of earth, may traverse the kingdoms from mineral to man by successive incorporations into the bodies of the organisms of those kingdoms. At one time, it enters into the formation of the mineral or rock. It is then absorbed by the vegetable kingdom and becomes a constituent of the body and fibre of a tree. Again, it is appropriated by the animal and at a still later period is found in the body of man. Throughout these degrees of its traversing the kingdoms from one form of phenomenal being to another, it retains its atomic existence and is never annihilated nor relegated to non-existence. Non-existence, therefore, is an expression applied to change of form, but this transformation can never be rightly considered annihilation, for the elements of composition are ever-present and existent, as we have seen, in the journey of the atom through successive kingdoms unimpaired. Hence, there is no death. Life is everlasting. So to speak, when the atom entered into the composition of the tree, it died to the mineral kingdom. And when consumed by the animal, it died to the vegetable kingdom, and so on, until its transference or transmutation into the kingdom of man. But throughout its traversing, it was subject to transformation and not annihilation. Death, therefore, is applicable to a change or transference from one degree or condition to another. In the mineral realm, there was a spirit of existence. In the world of plant life and organisms, it reappeared as the vegetative spirit. Thence it attained the animal spirit and finally aspired to the human spirit. These are degrees and changes, but not obliteration. And this is a rational proof that man is everlasting, ever living. Therefore, death is only a relative term implying change. For example, we will say that this light before me, having reappeared in another incandescent lamp, has died in the one and lives in the other. This is not death in reality. The perfections of the mineral are translated into the vegetable and from thence into the animal, the virtue always attaining a superlative degree in the upward change. In each kingdom, we find the same virtues manifesting themselves more fully, proving that the reality has been transferred from a lower to a higher form and kingdom of being. Therefore, non-existence is only relative and absolute non-existence inconceivable. This rose in my hand will become disintegrated and its symmetry destroyed, but the elements of its composition remain changeless. Nothing affects their elemental integrity. They cannot become non-existent. They are simply transferred from one state to another. Through his ignorance, man fears death. But the death he shrinks from is imaginary and absolutely unreal. It is only human imagination. The bestowal and grace of God have quickened the realm of existence with life and being. For existence there is neither change nor transformation. Existence is ever existence. It can never be translated into non-existence. It is gradation. A degree below a higher degree is considered as non-existence. This dust beneath our feet, as compared with our being, is non-existent. When the human body crumples into dust, we can say it has become non-existent. Therefore, its dust in relation to living forms of human being is as non-existent, but in its own sphere 
It is existent, it has its mineral being. Therefore it is well proved that absolute non-existence is impossible. It is only relative. The purpose is this, that the everlasting bestowal of God vouchsafed to man is never subject to corruption. Inasmuch as he has endowed the phenomenal world with being, it is impossible for that world to become non-being, for it is the very genesis of God. It is in the realm of origination. It is a creational and not a subjective world, and the bounty descending upon it is continuous and permanent. Therefore man, the highest creature of the phenomenal world, is endowed with that continuous bounty bestowed by divine generosity without cessation. For instance, the rays of the sun are continuous. The heat of the sun emanates from it without cessation. No discontinuance of it is conceivable. Even so, the bestowal of God is descending upon the world of humanity, never ceasing, continuous, forever. If we say that the bestowal of existence ceases or falters, it is equivalent to saying that the sun can exist with cessation of its effulgence. Is this possible? Therefore, the effulgences of existence are ever-present and continuous. The conception of annihilation is a factor in human degradation, a cause of human debasement and lowliness, a source of human fear and abjection. It has been conducive to the dispersion and weakening of human thought, whereas the realization of existence and continuity has upraised man to sublimity of ideals, established the foundations of human progress and stimulated the development of heavenly virtues. Therefore, it behooves man to abandon thoughts of non-existence and death which are absolutely imaginary, and see himself ever-living, everlasting in the divine purpose of his creation. He must turn away from ideas which degrade the human soul, so that day by day and hour by hour he may advance upward and higher to spiritual perception of the continuity of the human reality. If he dwells upon the thought of non-existence, he will become utterly incompetent. With weakened willpower, his ambition for progress will be lessened, and the acquisition of human virtues will cease. Therefore, you must thank God that he has bestowed upon you the blessing of life and existence in the human kingdom. Strive diligently to acquire virtues befitting your degree and station. Be as lights of the world which cannot be hit and which have no setting in horizons of darkness. Ascend to the zenith of an existence which is never be clouded by the fears and forebodings of non-existence. When man is not endowed with inner perception, he is not informed of these important mysteries. The retina of outer vision, though sensitive and delicate, may nevertheless be a hindrance to the inner eye, which alone can perceive. The bestowals of God, which are manifest in all phenomenal life, are sometimes hidden by intervening veils of mental and mortal vision, which render man spiritually blind and incapable. But when those scales are removed and the veils rent asunder, then the great signs of God will become visible, and he will witness the eternal light filling the world. The bestowals of God are all and always manifest. The promises of heaven are ever-present. The favors of God are all surrounding but should the conscious eye of the soul of man remained veiled and darkened, 
he will be led to deny these universal signs and remain deprived of these manifestations of divine bounty. Therefore we must endeavor with heart and soul in order that the veil covering the eye of inner vision may be removed, that we may behold the manifestations of the signs of God, discern his mysterious graces, and realize that material blessings, as compared with spiritual bounties, are as nothing. The spiritual blessings of God are greatest. When we were in the mineral kingdom, although we were endowed with certain gifts and powers, they were not to be compared with the blessings of the human kingdom. In the matrix of the mother, we were the recipients of endowments and blessings of God, yet these were as nothing compared to the powers and graces bestowed upon us after birth into this human world. Likewise, if we are born from the matrix of this physical and phenomenal environment into the freedom and loftiness of the spiritual life and vision, we shall consider this mortal existence and its blessings as worthless by comparison. In the spiritual world, the divine bestowals are infinite, for in that realm there is neither separation nor disintegration which characterize the world of material existence. Spiritual existence is absolute immortality, completeness, and unchangeable being. Therefore we must thank God that he has created for us both material blessings and spiritual bestowals. He has given us material gifts and spiritual graces, outer sight to view the lights of the sun and inner vision by which we may perceive the glory of God. He has designed the outer ear to enjoy the melodies of sound and the inner hearing wherewith we may hear the voice of our Creator. We must strive with energies of heart, soul, and mind to develop and manifest the perfections and virtues latent within the realities of the phenomenal world. For the human reality may be compared to a seed. If we sow the seed, a mighty tree appears from it. The virtues of the seed are revealed in the tree. It puts forth branches, leaves, blossoms, and produces fruits. All these virtues were hidden and potential in the seed. Through the blessing and bounty of cultivation, these virtues became apparent. Similarly, the merciful God, our Creator, has deposited within human realities certain latent and potential virtues. Through education and culture, these virtues deposited by the loving God will become apparent in the human reality, even as the unfoldment of the tree from within the germinating seed. I will pray for you, O thou kind Lord. These are thy servants who have gathered in this meeting, have turned unto thy kingdom, and are in need of thy bestowal and blessing. O thou, God, manifest and make evident the signs of thy oneness, which have been deposited in all the realities of life. Reveal and unfold the virtues which thou hast made latent and concealed in these human realities. O God, we are as plants, and thy bounty is as the rain. Refresh and cause these plants to grow through thy bestowal. We are thy servants. Free us from the fetters of material existence. We are ignorant. Make us wise. We are dead. Make us alive. We are material. Endow us with spirit. We are deprived. Make us the intimates of thy mysteries. We are needy. Enrich and bless us from thy boundless treasury. 
O God, resuscitate us, give us sight, give us hearing, familiarize us with the mysteries of life, so that the secrets of thy kingdom may become revealed to us in this world of existence, and we may confess thy oneness. Every bestowal emanates from thee, every benediction is thine. Thou art mighty, thou art powerful, thou art the giver, and thou art the ever bounteous. 39. Talk at Children's Meeting, Hotel Plaza, 5th May 1912, Chicago, Illinois. Notes by Marzia Moss. You are the children of whom Christ has said, Of such is the kingdom of God. And according to the words of Baha'u'llah, you are the very lamps or candles of the world of humanity, for your hearts are exceedingly pure and your spirits most sensitive. You are near the source. You have not yet become contaminated. You are the lambs of the heavenly shepherd. You are as polished mirrors reflecting pure light. My hope is that your parents may educate you spiritually and give you thorough moral training. May you develop so that each one of you shall become imbued with all the virtues of the human world. May you advance in all material and spiritual degrees. May you become learned in sciences, acquire the arts and crafts, prove to be useful members of human society, and assist the progress of human civilization. May you be a cause of the manifestation of divine bestowals, each one of you a shining star radiating the light of the oneness of humanity toward the horizons of the East and West. May you be devoted to the love and unity of mankind, and through your efforts may the reality deposited in the human heart find its divine expression. I pray for you, asking the assistance and confirmation of God in your behalf. You are all my children, my spiritual children. Spiritual children are dearer than physical children, for it is possible for physical children to turn away from the Spirit of God. But you are spiritual children, and therefore you are most beloved. I wish for you progress in every degree of development. May God assist you. May you be surrounded by the beneficent light of his countenance, and may you attain maturity under his nurture and protection. You are all blessed. To the friends, I am going away, but you must arise to serve the word of God. Your hearts must be pure and your intentions sincere in order that you may become recipients of the divine bestowals. Consider that although the sun shines equally upon all things, yet in the clear mirror its reflection is most brilliant and not in the black stone. This great effulgence and heat have been produced by the crystal clearness of the glass. If there were no clearness and purity, these effects would not be witnessed. Should rain fall upon salty, stony earth, it will never have effect. But when it falls upon good, pure soil, green and verdant growth follows, and fruits are produced. This is the day when pure hearts have a portion of the everlasting bounties, and sanctified souls are being illumined by the eternal manifestations. Praise be to God, you are believers in God, assured by the words of God, and turning to the kingdom of God. You have heard the divine call. Your hearts are moved by the breezes of the paradise of Abha. You have good intentions. Your purpose is the good pleasure of God. 
you desire to serve in the kingdom of the merciful one. Therefore, arise in the utmost power. Be in perfect unity. Never become angry with one another. Let your eyes be directed toward the kingdom of truth and not toward the world of creation. Love the creatures for the sake of God and not for themselves. You will never become angry or impatient if you love them for the sake of God. Humanity is not perfect. There are imperfections in every human being and you will always become unhappy if you look toward the people themselves. But if you look toward God, you will love them and be kind to them. For the world of God is the world of perfection and complete mercy. Therefore do not look at the shortcomings of anybody. See with the sight of forgiveness. The imperfect eye beholds imperfections. The eye that covers faults looks toward the creator of souls. He created them, trains and provides for them, endows them with capacity and life, sight and hearing. Therefore, they are the signs of his grandeur. You must love and be kind to everybody. Care for the poor, protect the weak, heal the sick, teach and educate the ignorant. It is my hope that the unity and harmony of the friends in Chicago may be the cause of the unity of the friends throughout America and that all people may become recipients of their love and kindness. May they be an example for mankind. Then the confirmations of the kingdom of Abha and the bestowals of the Son of Reality will be all encircling. 40. Talk at Plymouth Congregational Church 5th May 1912 935 East 50th Street, Chicago, Illinois Notes by Marzia Moss I offer thanks to God for the privilege of being present in an assemblage which is commemorating him, whose members have no thought or intention save his good pleasure and the unbiased investigation of reality. I praise God for this meeting of human souls, free from the bondage of imitations and prejudice, willing to examine reasonably and accept that which is found to be true. In our solar system, the center of illumination is the sun itself. Through the will of God, this central luminary is the one source of the existence and development of all phenomenal things. When we observe the organisms of the material kingdoms, we find that their growth and training are dependent upon the heat and light of the sun. Without this quickening impulse, there would be no growth of tree or vegetation, neither would the existence of animal or human being be possible. In fact, no forms of created life would be manifest upon the earth. But if we reflect deeply, we will perceive that the great bestower and giver of life is God. The sun is the intermediary of his will and plan. Without the bounty of the sun, therefore, the world would be in darkness. All illumination of our planetary system proceeds or emanates from the solar center. Likewise, in the spiritual realm of intelligence and idealism, there must be a center of illumination, and that center is the everlasting, ever-shining sun, the Word of God. Its lights are the lights of reality, which have shone upon humanity, illumining the realm of thought and morals, conferring the bounties of the divine world upon man. These lights are the cause of the education of souls and the source of the enlightenment of hearts, sending forth in effulgent radiance the message of the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. In brief, the moral and ethical world and the world of spiritual regeneration are dependent for their progressive being upon that 
heavenly center of illumination. It gives forth the light of religion and bestows the life of the spirit, imbues humanity with archetypal virtues and confers eternal splendors. This sun of reality, this center of effulgences, is the prophet or manifestation of God. Just as the phenomenal sun shines upon the material world, producing life and growth, likewise the spiritual or prophetic sun confers illumination upon the human world of thought and intelligence, and unless it rose upon the horizon of human existence, the kingdom of man would become dark and extinguished. The sun of reality is one sun, but it has different dawning places, just as the phenomenal sun is one, although it appears at various points of the horizon. During the time of summer, the luminary of the physical world rises far to the north of the equinoctial. In spring and fall, it dawns midway, and in winter, it appears in the most southerly point of its zodiacal journey. These day springs or dawning points differ widely, but the sun is ever the same sun, whether it be the phenomenal or spiritual luminary. Souls who focus their vision upon the sun of reality will be the recipients of light no matter from what point it rises. But those who are fettered by adoration of the dawning point are deprived when it appears in a different station upon the spiritual horizon. Furthermore, just as the solar cycle has its four seasons, the cycle of the sun of reality has its distinct and successive periods. Each brings its vernal season or springtime. When the sun of reality returns to quicken the world of mankind, a divine bounty descends from the heaven of generosity. The realm of thoughts and ideals is set in motion and blessed with new life. Minds are developed, hopes brighten, aspirations become spiritual. The virtues of the human world appear with freshened power of growth, and the image and likeness of God become visible in man. It is the springtime of the inner world. After the spring, summer comes with its fullness and spiritual fruitage. Autumn follows with its withering winds which chill the soul. The sun seems to be going away until at last the mantle of winter overspreads and only faint traces of the effulgence of that divine sun remain. Just as the surface of the material world becomes dark and dreary, the soil dormant, the trees naked and bare, and no beauty or freshness remains to cheer the darkness and desolation, so the winter of the spiritual cycle witnesses the death and disappearance of divine growth and extinction of the light and love of God. But again, the cycle begins and a new springtime appears. In it, the former springtime has returned. The world is resuscitated, illumined, and attains spirituality. Religion is renewed and reorganized. Hearts are turned to God. The summons of God is heard, and life is again bestowed upon man. For a long time the religious world had been weakened and materialism had advanced. The spiritual forces of life were waning, moralities were becoming degraded, composure and peace had vanished from souls, and satanic qualities were dominating hearts. Strife and hatred overshadowed humanity, bloodshed and violence prevailed. God was neglected. The sun of reality seemed to have gone completely. Deprivation of the bounties of heaven was a fact, and so the season of winter fell upon mankind. But in the generosity of God, a new springtime dawned. The lights of God shone forth, the effulgent sun of reality returned and became manifest. 
the realm of thoughts and kingdom of hearts became exhilarated, a new spirit of life breathed into the body of the world, and continuous advancement became apparent. I hope that the lights of the sun of reality will illumine the whole world, so that no strife and warfare, no battles and bloodshed remain. May fanaticism and religious bigotry be unknown. All humanity enter the bond of brotherhood. Souls consort in perfect agreement. The nations of earth at last hoist the banner of truth, and the religions of the world enter the divine temple of oneness. For the foundations of the heavenly religions are one reality. Reality is not divisible. It does not admit multiplicity. All the holy manifestations of God have proclaimed and promulgated the same reality. They have summoned mankind to reality itself, and reality is one. The clouds and mists of imitations have obscured the Son of Truth. We must forsake these imitations, dispel these clouds and mists, and free the sun from the darkness of superstition. Then will the Son of Truth shine most gloriously. Then all the inhabitants of the world will be united. The religions will be one, sects and denominations will reconcile. All nationalities will flow together in the recognition of one fatherhood, and all degrees of humankind will gather in the shelter of the same tabernacle, under the same banner. Until the heavenly civilization is founded, no result will be forthcoming from material civilization, even as you observe. See what catastrophes overwhelm mankind. Consider the wars which disturb the world. Consider the enmity and hatred. The existence of these wars and conditions indicates and proves that the heavenly civilization has not yet been established. If the civilization of the kingdom be spread to all the nations, this dust of disagreement will be dispelled. These clouds will pass away, and the sun of reality, in its greatest effulgence and glory, will shine upon mankind. O God, O Thou who givest, this congregation is turning to Thee, casting their glances toward Thy kingdom and favour, longing to behold the lights of Thy face. O God, bless this nation, confirm this government, reveal Thy glory unto this people, and confer upon them life eternal. O God, Illumine the faces, render the hearts radiant, exhilarate the breasts, crown the heads with the diadem of thy providence, cause them to soar in thy pure atmosphere, so they may reach the highest pinnacles of thy splendour. Assist them in order that this world may ever find the light and effulgence of thy presence. O God, Shelter this congregation and admonish this nation. Render them progressive in all degrees. May they become leaders in the world of humanity. May they be thine examples among humankind. May they be manifestations of thy grace. May they be filled with the inspiration of thy word. Thou art the powerful. Thou art the mighty, thou art the giver, and thou art the omniscient. 41. Talk at All Souls Church 5th May 1912 Lincoln Center, Chicago, Illinois Notes by Marzia Moss The Divine Religions were founded for the purpose of unifying humanity and establishing universal peace. Any movement 
which brings about peace and agreement in human society, is truly a divine movement. Any reform which causes people to come together under the shelter of the same tabernacle is surely animated by heavenly motives. At all times, and in all ages of the world, religion has been a factor in cementing together the hearts of men and in uniting various and divergent creeds. It is the peace element in religion that blends mankind and makes for unity. Warfare has ever been the cause of separation, disunion and discord. Consider how Jesus Christ united the divergent peoples, sects and denominations of early days. It is evident that the fundamentals of religion are intended to unify and bind together. Their purpose is universal, everlasting peace. Prior to the time of Jesus Christ, the Word of God had unified opposite types and conflicting elements of human society. And since his appearance, the divine teachers of the primal principles of the law of God have all intended this universal outcome. In Persia, Baha'u'llah was able to unite people of varying thought, creed and denomination. The inhabitants of that country were Christians, Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians and a great variety of subdivided forms and beliefs, together with racial distinctions such as Semitic, Arabic, Persian, Turk, etc. But through the power and efficacy of religion, Baha'u'llah united these differing peoples and caused them to consort together in perfect agreement. Such unity and accord became manifest among them that they were considered as one people and one kind. The cause of this fellowship and unity lies in the fact that the divine law has two distinct aspects or functions. One, the essential or fundamental, the other, the material or accidental. The first aspect of the revealed religion of God is that which concerns the ethical development and spiritual progress of mankind, the awakening of potential human susceptibilities and the descent of divine bestowals, these ordinances are changeless, essential, eternal. The second function of the divine religion deals with material conditions, the laws of human intercourse and social regulation. These are subject to change and transformation in accordance with the time, place and conditions. The essential ordinances of religion were the same during the time of Abraham, the day of Moses, and the cycle of Jesus. But the accidental or material laws were abrogated and superseded according to the exigency and requirement of each succeeding age. For example, in the law of Moses, there were ten distinct commandments in regard to murder which were revealed according to the requirement and capacity of the people. But in the day of Jesus, these were abrogated and superseded in conformity with the changed and advanced human conditions. The central purpose of the divine religions is the establishment of peace and unity among mankind. Their reality is one, therefore their accomplishment is one and universal whether it be through the essential or material ordinances of God. There is but one light of the material sun, one ocean, one rain, one atmosphere. Similarly, in the spiritual world, there is one divine reality forming the center and altruistic basis for peace and reconciliation among various and conflicting nations and peoples. 
consider how the Roman Empire and Greek nation were at war in enmity and hatred after the Messianic day, how the hostilities of Egypt and Assyria, though subdued in intensity, still flamed in the warring element of these ancient and declining nations. But the teachings of Jesus Christ proved to be the cement by which they were united. Warfare ceased, strife and hatred passed away, and these belligerent peoples associated in love and friendship. For strife and warfare are the very destroyers of human foundations, whereas peace and amity are the builders and safeguards of human welfare. As an instance, two nations which have remained at peace for centuries declare war against each other. What destruction and loss befalls both in one year of strife and conflict, the undoing of centuries. How urgent their necessity and demand for peace with its comfort and progress instead of war which blasts and destroys the foundation of all human attainment. The body politic may be likened to the human organism. As long as the various members and parts of that organism are coordinated and cooperating in harmony, we have as a result the expression of life in its fullest degree. When these members lack coordination and harmony, we have the reverse, which in the human organism is disease, dissolution, death. Similarly, in the body politic of humanity, dissension, discord and warfare are always destructive and inevitably fatal. All created beings are dependent upon peace and coordination, for every contingent and phenomenal being is a composition of distinct elements. As long as there is affinity and cohesion among these constituent elements, strength and life are manifest. But when dissension and repulsion arise among them, disintegration follows. This is proof that peace and amity, which God has willed for his children, are the saving factors of human society, whereas war and strife which violate his ordinances are the cause of death and destruction. Therefore God has sent his prophets to announce the message of goodwill, peace and life to the world of mankind. Inasmuch as the essential reality of the religions is one, and their seeming variance and plurality is adherence to forms and imitations which have arisen, it is evident that these causes of difference and divergence must be abandoned in order that the underlying reality may unite mankind in its enlightenment and upbuilding. All who hold fast to the one reality will be in agreement and unity. Then shall the religion summon people to the oneness of the world of humanity and to universal justice. Then will they proclaim equality of rights and exhort men to virtue and to faith in the loving mercy of God. The underlying foundation of the religions is one. There is no intrinsic difference between them. Therefore, if the essential and fundamental ordinances of the religions be observed, peace and unity will dawn, and all the differences of sects and denominations will disappear. And now, let us consider the various peoples of the world. All the nations, American, British, French, German, Turkish, Persian, Arab, are children of the same Adam, members of the same human household. Why should dissension exist among them? The surface of the earth is one native land, and that native land was provided for all. God has not set these boundaries 
and race limitations? Why should imaginary barriers, which God has not originally destined, be made a cause of contention? God has created and provided for all. He is the preserver of all, and all are submerged in the ocean of his mercy. Not a single soul is deprived. Inasmuch as we have such a loving God and Creator, why should we be at war with each other? Now that his light is shining universally, why should we cast ourselves into darkness? As his table is spread for all his children, why should we deprive each other of its sustenance? As his effulgence is shining upon all, why should we seek to live among the shadows? There is no doubt that the only cause is ignorance, and that the result is perdition. Discord deprives humanity of the eternal favors of God. Therefore we must forget all imaginary causes of difference and seek the very fundamentals of the divine religions in order that we may associate in perfect love and accord and consider humankind as one family, the surface of the earth as one nationality, and all races as one humanity. Let us live under the protection of God attaining eternal happiness in this world and everlasting life in the world to come. O thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence they are all thy servants, and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle, all have gathered together at thy table of bounty. All are illumined through the light of thy providence. O God, thou art kind to all. Thou hast provided for all, dost shelter all, conferrest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with talents and faculties, and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one, so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O God, Establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O God, the hearts together. O thou kind Father, God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving, and thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. <laughs>